This episode is sponsored by Echo. Hear clearly, care confidently. Learn more at echohealth.com. That's E K O health.com. And use code JSP for $50 off any stethoscope. Just Some Podcast Media. The thoughts and opinions on Just Some Podcast are of the hosts and guests and do not represent the views of organizations that employ them or they volunteer for. They are also not responsible for spontaneous black holes or nuclear wars that may occur. You have been been warned. Welcome, 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 everybody, to another fun-filled and exciting episode of Just Some Podcast. This is Tom. Hey, this is Ben. Tom, how's it going, man? It's going swell. Things are busy. I don't know. Just enjoying the summer and trying to keep the office moving. I understand that completely. Um, We've been super busy. We do a lot of DOT physicals for our bus drivers in the summertime, so we've been doing a lot of those, and then, of course, just all the other stuff that comes along with summer. So it's been, been good. Um, it's been a while since we've recorded. Uh, there's, you know, we're working on some stuff in the background and you know, life happens. And as everybody knows, you know, Tom and I have lives outside of podcasting and we both work full time and have families. And so, uh, you know, I have a daughter who's very athletic and into softball. And so, yeah, but we're back for now. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> We are back. We're excited. And well, we got other stuff to do, Ben. So let's get this episode going. Wow. All right. You're just like. <laughs> it's all business. That's Thomas, what I'm known no, for. No banter or nothing. He's just. No just banter. Just it. straight business. All right. Well, before we get into stuff, I do want to give a special shout out. My youngest daughter is huge into special effects makeup, and she's kind of self taught herself on YouTube. And it's come up with some amazing stuff just on her own. And so I was looking for a way to kind of help that creativity along and i found a a very cool class for her it's on outschool.com and so they have like a special effects makeup camp and then they have like an advanced makeup camp Um, both of those are taught by this wonderful person named alex mcgreevy and she's done amazing with my youngest daughter teaching her lots of cool special effects techniques and like frostbite and zombifying my kid and and very, very, very cool stuff. Um, so I want to give them a special shout out because I do appreciate everything that they are, are doing. And uh, do want to say, you know, of course, that they're not paying us. I That is just my own personal experience with them. But I do think that they do some amazing stuff. So if you have kids that are interested in that, um, it, it's all online classes, kind of like it was during the pandemic and very, very cool stuff. I will say I have seen several pictures. Ben has sent me some uh, pictures of what she's done, and she is just absolutely fantastic. She's got a long, bright future ahead of her in movie makeup, if she so wishes. Yeah, maybe then we can get her to fund the podcast. What do you think? I think that's a great idea. Let's start, you know, and there's no more child labor laws. They're repealing those left and right. So let's get on that. Uh, well, we better wait a little bit. She's just barely into double digits. So, you know, <laughs> don't matter in Iowa. Well, let's get Let's get moving to Iowa. So no one wants to live in Iowa. That's, that's, that's why I moved. Lives in Iowa, yeah, so. the same, that's why I moved way far away from Iowa. <laughs> so. But if you want to get into it, then, Tom, let's jump into our uh, story that you may have missed. See if we remember how to do this. I vaguely remember. So. The story you may have missed is going to take us to Spring Valley, Illinois. Spring Valley, Illinois, an Illinois hospital will shutter its doors this week, in part because of a devastating cyber attack on ransomware. And so experts are saying this is the first hospital to publicly link ransomware and hackers to its closure. St. Margaret's Health in Spring Valley will close Friday. You know, they did say that there was a number of factors, COVID-19 pandemic, of course, um, shortage of staff, but also they did link the cyber attack of the computer system to uh, causing part of their shutdown. Apparently, this happened in 2021. It halted their ability to submit claims to insurers, Medicare, and Medicaid for months, which is, of course, the lifeblood. Yeah. I mean, you got to, you know, that's what pays your bills. You know, some hospitals will keep, you know, 30, 60 days cash on hand or try to so that, you know, you at least have that. But, you know, once that starts going away and once that starts dwindling, you're, you know, how are you going to pay your staff? How are you going to pay 
all that good stuff if you can't submit insurance claims. So, yeah, the uh, the world of cyber attacks on healthcare infrastructure is just going to get worse, and it's been going on. I think it's not so much a dirty or dark secret. It's just one of those we just don't talk about it and we try to avoid it as much as possible, but it is something in healthcare. You never want to get those emails saying like, Hey, you know, something's down or this or what these problems are for. So if you're not in healthcare, yeah, this is something we have to deal with. And it is a very real threat. And I am just horrified for that community that they're losing a hospital over this. And you, if you're in healthcare and of course, um, my IT background is going to kick in here. Make sure that, you know, if you, if you don't recognize the email address or it looks suspicious, don't click on any links or anything like that because that's how they access it is. It's a phishing email and you click on that. And when you click on that, then it gives them access to your system. They can lock your system down and just kind of raise hell and wreak havoc, unfortunately. So I take it one step further, Ben. I just don't read or answer any emails. Well, now. there you go. That's, so, well, that's one option. Uh, when my boss is like, hey, I sent you an email, like, how do I know it's you? And so I just don't read anything. So Natalie, uh, that's why. So if you're listening, now you understand. So, But I do suspect that hospitals are going to have to be very, continue to be very vigilant and continue to uh, ensure the safety of... Well. Your and with systems. AI, with AI yeah. coming out, I mean, we're going to have to get way more robust to stop these type of attacks. Well, it, speaking it's going to get worse. Did, and I don't remember how long ago the story was. Did you see the story where the AI convinced someone to click the "I'm not a robot" box? No. So it was like, a, and a, if I find it, I'll throw a link in the show notes because I don't remember the exact story. But it was basically they set this eye up and they set it up with like a budget and said, okay, I want you to complete this task. Well, part of that task was that whole capture of, you know, and so AI went basically and created like a, an ad on like Fiverr for someone and basically paid someone to click the, I am not a robot. And wow. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, if I find the story, I'll send it to you. And like I said, I'll throw it in the show notes, but you know, and of course, it's like that whole, well, why do I need to click this if you can't, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's like, well, no, I just, you know, my, my fingers don't work and da, 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 da. And it's like, well, but that's what a robot would really say. And then they still did it. So. <laughs> yeah. To point out that's what a robot would say to the robot and then do what the robot says while saying, but that's what a robot would tell me to do. Sounds like a really bad Saturday Night Live skit. It does, but unfortunately it did happen. So, yeah, if, if I find that, I'll throw that in the show notes. But. Let's uh, do a social media shout out, Tom. Oh my gosh. Do you remember how to do that? I don't know. But you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all at Just Some Podcast, our website, www.justsomepodcast.com. Email us, admin, or JSP at Just Some Podcast.com. Either one works. And Tom, of course, we want to make sure that they, you know, listen to our other bevy of shows underneath the just some podcast media umbrella you have pollyanna over there with the buried pleasures and talking about all kinds of fun stuff over there it's a very sex positive show and uh, then of course we have will continue to monitor which is uh the other show that tom and i do which is our kind of creepy mystery weird stuff that we kind of approach it from a medical medical standpoint so good stuff over there too but Tom, let's say they want to tell about this show, the one that they're actually listening to now. Like, what could they do to help this show out? Probably tell people about it. I mean, that's one way. What else can they do? Send us money. I mean, that would work too, but what else can they do? Buy the products from our sponsors. What else can they do? Oh, okay. So if they don't want to do all of that other easy stuff before they buy anything from Amazon, they can go to our website. They can scroll down to just about the bottom of the page. They will see an Amazon affiliate link. Please click on that first. That way, anything you look at, click on and put it into your cart before you purchase it. Some of those proceeds go to us. It doesn't cost you anything. You won't even know we were there and it does help us out. We would really appreciate it. And we know lots of you use it. So we really thank you. We do. And we appreciate your support of sponsors too, because you know, we don't take on sponsors lightly. 
it's stuff that we actually legitimately do use and we do believe in. But speaking of sponsors, Tom, let's, uh, I would say, well, since we were just talking about them, let's talk about them. Yeah. Let's, let's, uh, listen to that. And on the other side, we'll get into our main story. Tom, I know that you are still using that echo core digital stethoscope. You still loving that thing. Every day I use it and I'm getting ready to have another student and I can't wait to show another new person how great this equipment is. It is truly the future of auscultation. It has 40 time amplification, noise cancellation, it Bluetooth to your phone. And I've seen the new stethoscope they come out with and this thing is, looks amazing. It even has like a three lady EKG on the head. I am chomping at the bits to get a piece of this thing. I, I cannot wait to order one. Correct. While I absolutely love mine, and I don't plan on getting the new one right away because, like I said, I have the Echo now, and it is absolutely fantastic. But when they come out with the stethoscope that just listens for you so I don't even have to wear it anymore, which at this rate they're going to, I will be buying that one immediately. (laughs) Well, go check them at echohealth.com, E-K-O-Health.com. Use code JSV. Give you $50 off your order. Let's know that we sent you. Tom, I know with the heat... And the summertime, you getting more aches and pains, being out with the in the yard with the kids and horsing around. Actually, Ben, I am having some extra pains, particularly in my neck. But it's because I'm old and I slept funny. I uh, yeah, fair it's, enough. It's time to have that real conversation for this uh, thirty second commercial. But I slept funny, and for the first time in my life, somehow got hurt doing so. I will tell you this: CBD stat. The new 7,500 milligram calming cream is truly what made my life bearable for the first 48 hours. I, I I honestly have been injured in sports plenty of times, and this was very painful for sleeping. I still flabbergasted that that was possible. But I will say 100% CBD stat products are what made it bearable. Yeah, and they, you know, had, like you said, the new 7,500 milligrams. They've also dropped their prices across the board. So, I mean, they're giving you more strength more milligrams for a cheaper price. That's pretty awesome of them. The other thing that's awesome is they love their healthcare workers. And they love their healthcare people. So if you're in healthcare, you can go to cbstat.care slash healthcare. You fill out that form, they're going to give you a permanent 40% discount. But Tom, they know that not all our listeners are in healthcare. They want to give them something too. So you go to cbstat.care. You put everything in your cart. At checkout, Tom, what code can they use? JSP20. That's right, JSP20. They're going to give you 20% off your order just because you're listening to us right now. Go check them out at cbdstat.care. All right. Now that everybody knows our sponsors, Tom, and how they can help us out by, you know, checking out our sponsors, let's get into our main topic, Tom. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but it is summertime. I just thought winter got really hot. Makes sense. I can see how you could think that. I'm a Husky guy. You used to be a Husky guy. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yes. Summer was not my friend. Swamp ass season is, is deep and legit, but I thought other than swamp ass, let's look at maybe some of the common ailments and issues and problems that you may see during the summer. And, you know, we'll talk about it as far as like, if you're out there, what to watch out for. And then like how we're going to treat that once you uh, come into your local primary office, urgent care or ER. And hopefully maybe we can give you some tips and advice that will keep you from having to bother those poor souls and treat you. You could just go and get it over the counter. Now, let's be fair. Some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about does require medical attention. You will not be able to get around some of that. But for the most part, what I was going to point out is that a lot of the stuff is just basic common sense and if you take care of yourself and watch what you're doing you can avoid some problems maybe maybe well let's get into one of our first ones tom sunburns uh yes so obviously sunburns happen whenever you're out in the sun and you don't take appropriate precautions like sunblock or staying in the shade or things of that nature now I'm glad you said the first thing, being out in the sun, because the very first thing that Ben said is important. Wear sunblock or stay in the shade or wear protective clothing. But the second thing, which alludes to the other thing he just mentioned, is you can still get burnt even if the sun is not directly out. There's this whole radiation thing going on from the sun. Yeah, it's a big 
you know, star and it's producing a lot of that. So you can get burnt through the clouds regardless. It is very important that you're wearing something with some kind of SPF blocking. Recently, Ben, I read some information and dermatology has really come a long way. And most dermatologists, according to the article I read on up to date stated, you should be using 30 SPF. You don't get a lot more protection for anything higher and you can get significantly less with lower. So 30 SPF is really the the wheelhouse of what you're searching for. Now, that doesn't mean if you only see 50 or 15 that you don't wear it because 30 is best. No, anything is better than nothing. What I'm trying to tell you is you don't need to get SPF 100. What you do need is SPF 30 and you need to apply it approximately every two hours. And the other thing to consider when you're talking about sunburns is if you're out in the pool and swimming or out in the lake or whatever, that water is going to reflect the sun and it's going to potentially burn you faster. Yes. Yeah. Secondly, make sure you're using a good waterproof sunblock or if you're not, make sure you're applying that more often, especially to those kiddos, um, you know, because we do see, you know, when you're in your teens and, and 20s, you don't think too much about your skin. You like that nice bronzed look. And then when you're, you know, in your 50s, we're cutting things off of you. Yeah. I mean, you know, it can, it's a cumulative effect or, you know, the over the years effect and it can turn into squamous cell and melanomas and all kinds of other problems. So not only that, um, having been a person that lived in Hawaii and I got a world class sunburn while I lived there, they are painful. I'm talking excruciatingly painful if you get a bad enough one. So how about we just make sure everyone stays not miserable this summer and you just wear some SPF 30 and you reapply it frequently. But Tom, let's say that they don't. Cause well, then I, I have no, I don't feel bad for them at all. I just spent the last six it. minutes telling them how to fix it. What are you going to do when they come to the primary office though? And say, you know, you're at your office and they come in with sunburns. What are you going to do? Laugh. You are not. Stop it. <laughs> I'm not going to laugh. Well, the first thing I'm going to probably say is you need to be getting lots of hydration. Your skin is going to get very, very, very dried out. Hydration is always important, but with skin injuries, just that much more. So make sure you stay really well hydrated, clean and dry, nothing harsh or no astringents, mild soap and water, aloe vera. But realistically, other than that is for, for most of my patients, if they're still in that one burgeoning to <laughs> sunburn area. That's pretty much what I tell them. I have in some cases used uh, silvadine. I have not had any burns that bad in the office anyways, that we, we got to that level. And most of that was kind of like when I worked more like urgent care and you'd see, I mean, pretty significant blistering. And like Tom said, I, hydration is a big thing too, because your skin is your largest organ. And so it is damaged and it is sending inflammatory markers to yeah. your skin which is going to further cause issues. So if you are burnt bad enough, honestly, IV replacements, especially if alcohol is involved, let's be, let's be real clear. If you got a sunburn and you've been outside because you were intoxicated, I really implore you to probably go get seen in an ER because you likely need some IV fluids. And that, that sounds ridiculous to most people, but honestly, if you're that dehydrated, you're going to be in the hurt locker and to make it from getting a lot worse. If you're that severely burnt, you really should be getting IV replacement. Which that just takes us right into our next ailment, Tom, during the summertime, which is dehydration. <laughs> <laughs> well, I already covered it. So move on for the most part. Yes. But <laughs> we do see, you know, people drink less fluids. Um, for some and it's reason. hotter outside. <laughs> and it is hotter outside. I, I know personally, I see more issues with UTIs and constipation in the office as well, just because, again, people aren't staying good and hydrated. Even if it's not a full-blown UTI, you get that dysuria because you're getting that thickening of your urine, which causes more irritation. So then even if you don't have a UTI, you're in my office because you think you do. One of the best things, and I have preached it to friends and family for a long time, and it I'm going to say a specific brand, but regardless is sports drinks, Gatorade, Powerade yep. can really make a huge difference. And one of the things, and again, I'm not telling you this isn't some kind of super secret, you know, if, if you don't like the taste, some people find Gatorade to be like a really strong taste, which I find odd. I think most people like it, but you know, there's some people out there that, Hey, it's a lot. Or if you actually want to get maximum value, like get the, 
the best electrolyte to water, usually it's about 50, 50. If you start mixing it up 50, 50, you can really stretch it out and get a lot of really good hydration, but it tastes crappier. Let's face the facts here. So if you want maximum uh, enjoyment, full blown Gatorade, if you really want maximum hydration, 50, 50 water and uh, Gatorade is going to give you a really good mix. And again, that's not official. I'm sure somebody from Gatorade just threw something against the wall from hearing that, but to tell the truth, that's what it would be for any of them. Powerade, Gatorade, it doesn't really matter. What you want to maximize though is water volume getting in. You would need to be drinking a lot. Well, and so some of the things we may see in the office or in walk-in or, or urgent cares or ERs is with dehydration is, you know, we may see some tachycardia. We may see changes in blood pressure, things of that nature. Like I tell patients, I know it sounds weird, but whenever you come in and your legs are swollen and so you're like, oh my God, I have all this edema. Well, it's because you're not drinking enough because your body is retaining that fluid because it doesn't know when it's going to get more. So the best way to help that edema is actually to drink more fluid. And they're like, wait a minute, I have too much fluid and you're telling me to drink more. Yes. Yes, I am. Yes, yes, yes. This is what you pay us for. Believe me on this one. Another big one that people don't think about is dizziness or orthostatic hypotension. So they start standing up or they go to sit up and they want to pass out. And they're like, oh my God, it's, it's because you're dehydrated. That's the primary cause. Now there's a couple of tricks and you know things that we can do to verify that. But primarily, I'm going to tell you right now, if you got a sunburn, if you've been out, you know, in the sun, if you've been doing anything physical, or you're just not drinking enough water, you can get dehydrated real quick and dizziness and orthostatic hypotension, which is that dizziness with change of position, becomes very prominent. So if you start to feel dizzy, lightheaded, first thing you need to be doing is getting some water. Stress the water there, or like you said, Gatorade or, or electrolyte yeah, yeah. replacement there. But yeah, and again, I don't care what brand company, r- really, that's regardless. I say Gatorade because everybody knows what Gatorade is. So something like Gatorade or a Gatorade product, whatever it is, but drink lots and lots of fluids. I, I try and tell people a, a basic rule of thumb is around 100 ounces a day. You need to be getting in around 100 ounces of fluid a day. Now, there's lots of algorithms that says, you know, based on your height, your weight, your BMI, whatever, this is exactly whatever. Rule of thumb, 100 ounces a day. That's what you should be shooting. And while we're talking fluids, let's not talk about what we frequently see, which is, well, you know, I've been out in the hot sun all day and I've been sitting out the lake. And so, you know, I cracked me a beer and Crack me another beer. Yeah. I got 12 Keystone lights on board. Yeah. Well, that's not now granted a lot of that is water in those beers, but it's not just water and it's got alcohol in it, which has an, well, a diuretic effect. effect. Yes. Uh, It literally suppresses the anti diuretic hormone. (laughs) Okay. Which you think would have a cooler name, but it's literally called the anti diuretic hormone. So when you drink alcohol, it suppresses that, which is also why you pee more, but now you're not retaining water. So it doesn't matter what you do. You're going to become less fluid, uh, rich. So again, beer and alcohol margaritas as great as they may taste are not a fluid replacement. They're not. And I would say if you're out on the lake or out playing softball or something like that, where you can, you know, you're, you're doing more things and I don't want to kill your buzz, but honestly I would it, a beer and then a water, a beer and then a water is going to be your best bet to make sure that you're staying adequately hydrated and not getting dehydrated and causing other problems. One of the basic rules I try and tell people is if you're going to have a beer, you need to have a water in between. Like that's just minimal amount of fluids, but to be key, don't drink alcohol while you're trying to stay hydrated. Well, let's stick with heat, Tom. And uh, let's talk. Because is it on? Is it on the streets? The heat, it is. You totally missed my 80s music reference right there. Eh. Well, everybody else I saw Beverly Hills Cop is just rolling on the floor. So we're all sad for you. That's all right. I'm used to it. Let's talk heat stroke, Tom. Move on. I, these are all easy, Ben. I thought we were going to have a challenging episode here. Well, let's talk about signs and symptoms, Tom. Okay, so the primary things that we're going to be looking for heat stroke are exactly what you're thinking. People are going to become faint, weak, or pass out. Now, they may not go all the way down. They, Like I said, they may just become very weak. 
But the key thing that you're going to be looking for is that this person is clearly not functioning in a correct manner. They might be coming having or might be coming having difficulty with speech, like the guy talking and that you're listening to right now. They might start slurring words. You're going to notice they're probably not going to be sweating. They may actually be very cool to the touch or extremely hot. But either way, you're going to notice they're pretty dry. And that is not a good sign because when the human body finally starts going, I don't have enough water to even try and cool myself down anymore. You are in the late stages of something bad happening. That person needs to be cooled down as quick as possible, preferably inside. If there was something there indoors covered so they're out of the sun, out of the direct heat and in air conditioning, that is one of the best things you can do for them immediately. And then obviously get them fluids. Uh, like you said, the big thing there is if you're outside and you stop sweating, you're in trouble. That's a problem. Yeah, you're you're behind the eight ball now. Um, you know, and and this is times we've seen you know ER or EMS bring them in and their core temperatures crazy high, and we're trying to cool them down. And there are lots of fun ways we can cool you down in the ER. None of which you're probably <laughs> going to like. Yeah, like the 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 easy one is stuff like we put uh, ice in some bags and we stuff them in your crotch and your uh, armpits and stuff like that. That's that's the it's not comfortable, but it's not bad. It gets worse, <laughs> much worse. There there are ways we can uh, cool and warm you both. Uh, yes, internally. Yes, yes. In your yes, in your urethra, it's going to go up into your bladder, and then we're going to either use cool fluid or we're going to use warm fluid, depending on what we're trying to do to you to uh, work on your core body temperature. So again, if you're to that point, things are not going well for you. Yeah. We're going to shove a tube in your arm and possibly another tube in your pee hole. So if you want to avoid that couple simple things you can do, one, stay hydrated Two, try and stay out of the sun for very long periods of time or have access to somewhere cool to sit when you can rest. Those are the very easy things. Here's the thing that usually happens, though. People are usually doing something when they when they catch heat stroke, so they become focused on what they're doing instead of staying hydrated or staying out of the heat. Not many people get heat stroke on purpose is what I'm trying to say. So it's important for you to start to mention to your loved ones or your friends while they're with you or notice yourself, hey, you know, am I starting to become crampy? You know, am I getting lots of cramps? Is it just getting hard to walk around? I know that sounds funny, but if you can't walk more than a couple of steps without getting a cramp in your leg, you need to be getting some water. And you're going to have that flushed red skin. I mean, you're, there are, you, know, you can't have heat exhaustion before you heat stroke. And so that's when you're going to be like, for most people that are sweating profusely, very bright red skin, very warm. And that is kind of like your body's like yes, warning stop. signal. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. And of course, yeah, you know, you see- our show is directed to medical professionals. So obviously what we're trying to do is give you tips to give to your patients. But for our non-medical people listening, we want to try to help keep them out of your clinics and ERs and urgent cares. Exactly. You have enough stuff to do. If we can keep somebody, and not only that, it's what's best for the patient. If the patient never comes and sees you, that means the patient never got sick or felt bad. So you did your job. Absolutely. All right, Tom. Um, Food poisoning. Yeah. Yeah. And you'd think, well, well, why food poisoning? Well, well, because because you like to torture me and a year ago I had it. Yes, that was exactly why. It was (laughs) a long plot. I was playing the long game, Tom. Quite impressed. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. You gave me salmonella a year ago so we could talk about it on the show. Oh, well, for those that have not, have you ever had food poisoning, Ben? Not that I vividly recall. Well, I can pretty vividly recall it. Um, I will tell you this. So I, I will let you talk about the standards. I'm just going to talk about my experience. One, I was an idiot. I, absolutely 100% now in retrospect should have gone to a hospital (laughs) should have absolutely been admitted and getting IV fluids. But honestly, within 24 hours, I was so weak. I no longer moved from in front of my toilet. So that's, that's a hundred percent true. I just laid in the fetal position in some form of a washcloth on my face because 
honestly, and again, I'm not trying to be too graphic or gross for our crowd, but this is the truth of somebody with salmonella poisoning. I could no longer make it to the bathroom. Just sitting in my living room and having to walk to my first floor bathroom became too arduous a trip in the beginning because of speed. I couldn't make it there. I was puking too much, too hard, too fast. And then honestly, after I puked for so long, I just couldn't make it. And so ended up on my floor. Uh, It was not a fun experience. And that lasted for multiple days. So what factors can I say coming away from it? I had no idea that I was going to get it. So unlike some of the things I'm going to let Ben talk about where he may say, Hey, the best thing to do is not eat something sketchy like uh, gas station sushi. That's not what I did. Okay. I had a regular peanut butter sandwich (laughs) <laughs> and then got god awful ill okay so i didn't do anything wrong i just ate a peanut butter sandwich i've done plenty of stupid things in my life but the two worst things that happened to me last year were just me standing still so <laughs> so i i will tell you though the the experience was was absolutely terrible and do not try and be a tough guy if you are puking to the point where you are like getting blurry vision or having trouble standing up absolutely go see a medical professional and don't think that you can just tough it out because you really need medical help. So obviously food poisoning is going to be something that you have consumed in Tom's case, a peanut butter sandwich that for whatever theoretically, reason, theoretically, let me say for legal purposes, allegedly. allegedly it wasn't the thing that was all over the news that I had also consumed, which gave me the same thing that everybody else got. But I didn't get the jar tested. I cannot say 100% what happened. But you consumed but something. And then <laughs> I consumed something made from peanuts in a buttery-like consistency that then went into my face and then caused it to immediately come out of my face <laughs> within 30 minutes. <laughs> so, and that's a pretty common well, maybe side a couple effect. hours. Or that's yeah. a pretty common symptom of food poisoning is your body's immediate rejection <laughs> yeah. of said – Yeah. Yeah. Stuff. Food, yes. Yeah. So you're going to have lots of nausea, lots of vomiting. Whatever Diarrhea. else has been in your, your <laughs> GI tract is going to continue passing through your GI tract, through your small bowel, large bowels, and so that's going to cause a lot of diarrhea. The reason that we see this in the summertime more frequently, say, than other times is, well, you know, we like to go out on picnics, we like to go to the beach, and, well, you know, we made some potato salad with some mayonnaise, and it's set out on the beach all day, and then we eat said potato salad in the picnic or at the beach and we've made ourselves sick. I I like how Ben nicely put it that the food would then come back out of you. Let me explain. So if a normal vomiting is a regular subway car, this stuff is Japanese bullet train. All right. And I do mean both directions. It is just terrible. And I have been ill before in my life. And I assure you food poisoning is at the top of the vomit diarrhea scale. Like it's, it may not be number one, but boy, howdy, it's, it's a contender. So Tom, let's say that you are working at your office and someone comes in with food poisoning. Say they've been there 24 hours or so. So what are you going to, what are you going to do? Well, okay. So to be completely fair, it's going to be a, a combination of things. If they're like, hey, I'm having some you know, nausea, some you know, abdominal pains. First, I'm probably going to assume they may have gastritis as well or instead of food poisoning. So I'm going to consider all that. I'm probably going to treat with some sort of anti-emetic like Zofran and then say, make sure you're getting lots of fluids. However, let's flip the script a little bit. What if they are you know, 24 hours into it. And they're like, I only came here because I barely have the will to live. That person needs to go to an ER for fluid yes. replacement. And so I, I, I say this in pr- partially in jest because I was that person. I, like I said, I, sh- I should have been, but if you're one of those people and I am, I don't want to go to the doctor's office if I don't need to, preventative medicine is your key. So what could we have told me back then is fluid, fluid, fluids. And if you haven't noticed the theme through this show, it should be that fluids are really good. Cause it's hot during the summertime. Yes. And you lose a lot of extra fluids. Unless you're one of our listeners on the other side of the world where it's currently winter, then 
well, then you're in Australia and it's still like a thousand degrees. So, I mean, the same rules apply to you year round. If you're in Australia, then, um, you know, watch for wobby gongs. I just, I just learned about them. It's a shark sits on the bottom of the ocean. That sounds terrifying. And it sounds Australian. It's called a wobby gong. It does sound Australian. Yes. I thought it was some weird plant or something. Nope. All right, Tom. Summer colds. They are a fact. Yeah. That it's a, it's a misnomer because people hear the word cold and they're frying their butt off outside. They just assume it's not possible. But I assure you, the viral upper respiratory infection does not care what time of year it is. Very, very true. And as you alluded to, it is a virus. And so that z pack isn't going to help that virus. It is ab- absolutely not going to help at all. So, you know, we're going to see you're going to come in and cough congestion. You may have fevers. You're very similar to any upper respiratory infection that you would have during any other time. You know, I personally, I think in this area, like right now they're cutting wheat and all of the fields around us. So I think, I think some of ours kind of starts out allergy type symptoms and then it just kind of progresses. And, and, and that's a pretty, especially in the Midwest, that's a pretty common thing. And often it, well, I don't understand when people are like every year at the same time, I get a sinus infection. I'm like, it never occurred to you <laughs> that this was environmental allergens. Um, and I'll be real honest. That that sounds, it sounds pretty obvious, but when you're the person that you're like all year, I feel great. And I just feel sick this one time a year. I can absolutely see why you think it's a sinus infection, but if you're the healthcare professional that's taking care of that person, you probably need to start going, could it be something else? And could possibly Flonase and or Zyrtec fix this problem? The answer is probably yes. Probably yes. So, and, you know, if it's running two, three days, I would hold off on antibiotics. Because, you know, we're trying to be very good stewards of our antibiotics so we don't cause super bugs in the future. And not only that, we just told you it won't help a virus anyways. So it's pointless on top of pointless. True. But... And I think probably, at least in my experience, I think post-COVID, which is a weird thing to say now, (laughs) I think people are more cognizant of like respiratory type stuff now. Oh, obviously. I shouldn't say obviously like that. I just meant like, yeah, big time. Like, boy, howdy. Suddenly everybody knows about upper respiratory infections. And, And that's not a bad thing. I'm glad people pay more attention to that. However... It hasn't changed people going, well, I need a Z pack. No, you really don't. You need to just, you know, give it a couple more days, take some antihistamines and let it take its course. So the other thing to be mindful for when you're looking at these viral colds and upper respiratory infection, of course, is we do see an exacerbation of asthma in a lot of patients during the summertime because of the heat, because you're out being more active, things of that nature. And so, you know, if they do have any underlying re- reactive airway disease or asthma, you want to be cognizant of that as well so some of the the couple quick things you can do are the things that we've been telling everybody to do the last several years well hell we've been telling people to do that since you know there were radio stations and they let people in medical professions talk on them which was wash your hands if you have a cough or a cold either don't go outside or wear a mask i mean it's the same stuff we've been saying for years except now hopefully people are going to pay attention to it Trying to stay away from people as best you can, yeah. Yeah, and and here's the thing. We all want to go out and have a great time, but nobody wants to be sick. So if you're feeling crappy, stay away from people. They don't want to feel crappy either. The last uh, kind of summer ailment I want to touch on is just kind of very briefly, and that is, you know, obviously swimming is a big thing in the summertime because it's hot and you want to go cool off. And so you go jump in your local pool, or let's say you don't have a local pool, um, or, you know, it's rural areas like where I live. And so, you know, you're swimming in the creek or you're swimming in the river. Um, I say that's how you know it's it's going to be backwards because you said creek. I know. I, if, I that that waterway is des- yeah, if that waterway is described as a creek, you had better get a shot before you go in it. <laughs> you, may, you may not need a shot before you go in it, but. <laughs> I would definitely have my tetanus updated. Lake water. Uh, creeks, rivers, things like that, and some pools. Be very, very mindful of your children and like swallowing that water. There are things floating in that water. You know, as I tell my children, like, you know, at the lake, I'm like, you know, you don't drink this water because fish be in it. 
but obviously it's m- way more than that. I mean, there are tons of bacteria and protozoa. So uh, it's probably, yeah. Yes. And you can get all kinds of nasty, nasty infections that will can mimic some of the other stuff that we've talked about as far as like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, things like that. And it's because you have a protozoa or a, a bacteria that you swallowed. Not to mention things like, you know, the, and I think it's, it's very dramatized on the news, but you hear about the flesh eating bacteria. There is a bacteria. I know it's in fresh water that it can actually cross the blood brain barrier. It can get into your, your head. So there are, and again, those are extremely rare cases, Yes, but they are present. So if your kid suddenly is like running 103 fever and he went out, you know, swimming in, you know, a crick, you may actually want to get that kid checked out sooner than later. Uh, if that's a possibility. So I, I want to bring up one other thing though, Ben, I, I feel like you're about to close the show and I there's, was thinking I, about it. well, I think there's one other thing we don't got to talk about it long, but I, I feel we got to cover and that's uh, the old contact dermatitis, Ben. How could I forget? Oh yeah. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's like one of the major things we see each summer. So people love to be outside and they love, and I can't imagine why. Cause I personally like to stay inside in air conditioning, but people that love to go outside love to rub against plants that they don't know what they are. I don't know what kind of sick, you know, enjoyment you people get out of rubbing leaves that you've never seen all over you. But at least once a week, I get a pretty good case of contact dermatitis I'm taking care of. And uh, well, the basics are going to be the same across the board, regardless of it's poison ivy, sumac, oak, or whatever. You're going to get a red bl- blistery type cluster or rash. I will say it's a little different based on which plant, and poison ivy tends to be some straight lines in there. So that's a really easy way to tell if it's a, a poison ivy. But what gets you is you don't wash your hands. So then you scratch it, and then you start rubbing it, and then next thing you know, you got in your face, your crotch, your armpit, and you are just miserable. And it's the oil that is transferred to your skin, that then you're touching it and touching other places with the oil still on your hands. Very similar to if you've ever cut up jalapenos <laughs> and you didn't wear gloves and didn't wash your hands well, that capsaicin oil, think of that very similar to like a, like a poison ivy or poison sumac. Everywhere you touch now is going to have it. So when you go to the bathroom, when you rub your eye, yeah, problems. Obviously with a poison ivy, you said, you know, it's, or sumac, you know, it's that blistery rash. And you're like, but Tom, what if it's shingles? Well, the main difference is going to be shingles is going to have a very similar look, but it's going to be on one nerve. It's not going to be in multiple places. And very rarely have I seen poison ivy in one spot only. Yeah. Poison ivy, poison oak, po- any of the contact dermatitis uh, issues tend to be in more than one spot. We do try and take into account, is this a possibility of shingles? Obviously. But more likely, especially if it's a young kid, it's going to be something contact. So what do we do? Well, the basics are over-the-counter creams and lotions are just as good as anything else. Use them. Calamine, hydrocortisone, Benadryl. uh, They make itch sprays with lidocaine in it. There are a million things out there. The point is, is for basic contact dermatitis, you don't need anything more powerful than that. As a matter of fact, you're just going to irritate the rest of you for more powerful than that. Just use your basic steroid creams or topicals and let the thing go away in a couple of days. But if it but. is more severe. <laughs> yeah, but. So particularly with faces, I'm very. Yeah. Uh, faces uh, near eyes. Yes. Yeah. Because you don't want that to get yeah in the eye or anywhere like that. I have not ever seen a case. I've heard of cases where like, say people are burning in their yard and they're burning poison. Ivy yeah. And in their smoke. mouth. Yeah. And so yeah. that. that I'm like, now imagine that rash you have on your skin inside your lungs. That can be a very, very severe issue. So be mindful. If you're that allergic and you're around a burning pile and you think you've been exposed, I would honestly tell you go to an ER immediately because that's an airway. And that's one thing as a, you know, we're former ER nurses. Airways are just things you don't screw around with. If you think something, anything you're doing could compromise your airway, it is not worth your life. You need to be so. If you're highly allergic to poison ivy and you think you've been around a burn pile with poison ivy, you should be getting medical care. But realistically, let's say you get a pretty bad case. It's on your face. 
the main thing we're going to treat you with is steroids. We're probably going to give you a more whopping dose than you can get topically, or at least that's yes. what I tend to do with I my do. patients. And it, it really does matter on the patient at this point. I will tell you oral and injectable steroids, they have roughly the same profiles, uh, cost. It's going to be much more expensive to get that injection in the office, but some people just insist or they feel like it works better. I would say if you're really caring about convenience, that's the main difference for me. Because you get a shot of solumedrol or depomedrol, you're going to be good for the next two weeks versus you have to take prednisone every day orally. So it's a little more intensive, but let's be fair. It's not intensive at all to take a medication once a day orally. No, and the other little things I would caution against. I mean, I, I I'm I'm big on with decadron and depomedrol. It's kind of my what I my yeah. Go-to. I like the decadron depomedrol too. Uh, obviously, diabetics you can't. I won't say you can't do that. I uh, am hesitant highly suggest to do not. That. Yeah, do not do it <laughs> at all because it's going to make their sugars go absolutely bonkers. Five six hundred sometimes. And the other thing is, and this is just kind of a, a change in understanding and attitude and, and such. You can, in some cases, albeit rare, get steroid-induced psychosis, particularly in the geriatric population. So it, it's for pr- them, I, and again, it's very rare, but I would much rather use a lower dose of steroid to decrease that chance than pop them with a shit ton of steroid and run yeah. that risk. Yeah, I, I'll be real honest. That's not something I've really considered in most of my – now, the diabetes, absolutely. That is the number one thing we have to consider when treating with a patient with oral or injectable steroids is, is this person's blood sugar going to go through the roof and is that going to be a problem? If it's not and they're miserable, I hit them up. If not and they're not that miserable, you get the basic calamine, you know, whatever we need to use to get – get you through it. The point is, is that the biggest problem you're going to have is inflammation and steroids reduce inflammation. So if you want to get rid of the itch or the sting, put a steroid on it. Usually that's going to take care of it. Unless you're in one of those weird situations like Ben was talking about, like you inhaled it or got it into your mouth or your eyes somehow, then it can go get immediate medical care. But realistically, some over-the-counter steroid creams or Benadryls, and you're going to be just fine. Uh, the only other thing I would say, and just from experience, of course, I'm, most of our medical providers probably know this, poison ivy is relatively a short course. I mean, you know, you're looking maybe a week or so. Sumac, I've seen it linger for 30 days. Um, my wife got some, into some sumac uh, a year or two ago, and she's like, this is horrible. And I'm like, it's time. Like, I, there's nothing else I can do other than just like, I'm sorry, but like... Yeah, and and honestly, to be able to differentiate on the fly, like out in public or based off the rash, sumac versus oak versus ivy can get real confusing. I would say, look, here's the deal. If you don't know what the plan is, don't rub it on your parts. And there you go. I mean, I think that should be a... a... <laughs> if you don't know what it is, don't rub it on you. There you go. That's. I mean, it sounds like basic Sh- idea, right? Sure, there. that sounds like a t-shirt. Um <laughs> All right. Well, anything else you want to cover under common summer ailments? No, guys, we've said it 10,000 times. And here's the crazy part. The people that aren't going to listen aren't going to listen regardless. Stay hydrated. All right. Uh, Honestly, 90% of the problems we've talked about today can be prevented easily with basic hydration. (laughs) All right. So Go out, have a great time, but drink some water or drink some Kool-Aid, wear some SPF 30, and and just enjoy your life. But it's that simple. Hydration, SPF 30, good times. That's and the recipe. If your uh, provider, you know, take care, take the opportunity with those like DOT exams or annual exams that are, you know, they may come in during the summer for that. Or let's say they're just in for like a routine like hypertension follow-up stress the, hey, you know, it's really hot outside and, you know, the heat index is 110. So make sure you're staying good and hydrated out there so that you don't end up causing problems. I mean, there, there's lots of good time to educate your patients. And it's only just a few minutes of time. That, that could prevent, save them a lot of heartache. Yeah. And, you know, prevents them from going to the ER or, or somewhere else. So, and like Tom says, you know, if that, that's ultimately what it's about is taking care of our patients. All right. Well, Tom, let's wrap up this episode. You know, I'm like you said, SPF 30, good hydration, good times. Enjoy yourselves. So, If you don't know what it is, don't rub it on your junk. 
there you go. Or anywhere else. Yeah, well, yeah, generally nowhere, but you know, especially not junk. On that note, take care of yourselves and each other. Hey, everybody, stay safe out there. Practice swearing just to pass the time. Lately, I see why I am alone. I caught some road bridge and I thought of you. And all the many times you say I should have known. Took a press so I could find my cheek. Without you